Hey everyone, this is Wartime Workshop, and this is a U.S. Army Signal Corps model GN45 hand crank generator, manufactured around 1943. This generator converts human muscle power into electricity, which can be used to power the transmitter section of the BC-654 radio set that I've been working to restore. In this video, part 3 of my series on the BC-654, I'm going to bring my GN45 back to operating condition so I can use it as a historically accurate power source for my transmitter. To get started, I removed the top cover from the generator. I then removed the serialized nameplate, and discovered a serial number stamped into the casting that didn't match the number on the plate. This wasn't surprising, as I was already suspicious I might not have the original nameplate for this unit. The GN45 was produced in two easily distinguishable versions, designated models A and B. The case, mechanism, and internal circuitry of my generator all match the specifications for the A model, but the nameplate is from the B model. The unit shows signs of repainting, and a number of repairs, so it's clearly been worked on before. It's likely the original data plate went missing, or got mixed up with another unit at some point. I'll be rectifying this in a future video, but to prevent confusion between models, I chose to leave this mismatched nameplate off the generator for the time being. Continuing with the disassembly, I started to remove components, assessing their condition as I went. The state of the greased mechanical parts looked pretty good, but there was a bit more degradation on the dry internal assembly. I knew I would have to clean and check the electrical functionality of all these passive filter elements, so I removed them and set them aside. Unfortunately, as I removed this low-voltage filter capacitor, I broke the heads off the mounting screws, revealing threads that had rusted in place in the core of this choke. Thankfully, this mistake would be repairable, and it was the only issue I encountered during disassembly. With the drive system and filter elements removed, I started inspecting the components of the generator itself, comprising a rotor, two field windings, and a pair of brushed commutators. The field windings function as electromagnets. When the mechanism begins to turn, residual magnetism induces a current in the rotor. Some of this current flows through the field windings, which generate a sustained magnetic field as the rotor continues to turn. As I inspected these components, I discovered a problem. One of the field windings was mounted at an angle to the rotor axis. This misalignment was causing the rotor to rub against the winding, preventing it from spinning freely. When I examined the mounting points for the field winding, I noticed that one of the screws looked… wrong. There was some sort of filler compound in the slot, and after removing the screw, I found that this filler continued down into the mounting hole. I popped out the filler compound with a pick, which uncovered a bunch of damage in the hole underneath. Here was the source of the misalignment. The position of the field winding was set by this countersink and somebody attempting a previous repair had gotten the alignment wrong. To fix the problem, I started by boring a new cylindrical pocket concentric to the location where I wanted the countersunk hole. Then I turned a countersunk steel bushing and glued it into the pocket using epoxy. I applied excess epoxy to the repair, then shaped and sanded the area to create the geometry I wanted. The whole process cost me a bit more of the original paint than I would have liked. But luckily, it's pretty common to see touch-up paint on equipment of this sort. I think the color match came out looking pretty good. After reinstalling the mounting screws, I went back and checked my footage to make sure I'd fixed the misalignment. Here's the winding before my repair, and here it is after. Everything is now back in alignment, and most importantly, the rotor spins freely on its bearings. As the rotor turns, an alternating electric current is induced in its windings. This is where the commutators become important. On either side of the commutator rings are sets of carbon electrodes called brushes. These brushes change the polarity of the current from the rotor depending on its position, so current flows in only one direction once it leaves the rotor. When I removed the brushes from the generator, I found some of them were in decent shape, and a couple were broken. Because these are wear items, I decided to save the originals for future reference, and make my own reproduction brushes for operation. First, I obtained some modern carbon brush material and sanded it to match the dimensions of an original brush. Next, I 3D printed a fixture that could hold a single brush with only the rearmost section exposed, 
and used this fixture to carve out the spring interface geometry on the back of my repro. Then I prepared high-resolution scans of the original brushes and traced their markings in Fusion 360. From this geometry, I used a CNC engraving machine to apply the appropriate markings to the reproduction brushes. I then installed the brushes into the generator and wrapped sandpaper around the commutator rings, spinning the rotor by hand to shape the contact surfaces of the brushes. I thoroughly cleaned the generator internals afterward to remove any conductive dust that didn't stick to the sandpaper. The two sets of commutators in the GN45 conduct two different rotor voltages, a 6-volt supply for the transmitter filament and a 500-volt supply for the transmitter plates. I followed this same process for both the high-voltage brushes, made of normal graphite, and the low-voltage brushes, made of metal graphite. Due to materials availability, my repros came out a bit shorter than the originals, but this isn't a problem as the brushes are supposed to wear down as they're used. I next turned my attention to the filter system, which is a collection of passive electrical components that smooth out the rough signal produced by the mechanical elements of the generator. First up was the choke which was in pretty bad shape externally. After trying and failing to remove the broken off screws non-destructively, I decided to drill them out completely, tap the bores, and install helical threaded inserts. These would be covered up by fasteners after reassembly, so I wasn't too concerned about their appearance. I next removed as much surface rust as I could from the choke housing, using repeated applications of rust dissolver. I also reattached a piece of string that had originally been tied around the choke winding. Then I checked the inductance of the coil to make sure my modifications to the core hadn't taken it out of spec. The other two filter elements requiring attention were both capacitors, an electrolytic cap on the low voltage side, and a large paper cap on the high voltage side. The low voltage cap was no longer in working condition, so I decided to restuff it with a modern equivalent. Unfortunately, the wrapper on this cap was extremely tight, and I wasn't able to remove it without risking damage. I ended up just cutting the whole thing in half in a location that would be hidden by the mounting bracket. I cleaned out the original guts, made holes for the new leads, then inserted the replacement with a plastic bushing to keep the two halves of the can concentric. Finally, I resoldered the original ground wire to the protruding lead of the replacement. I only had modern galvanized screws available to replace the broken capacitor mounting screws, so I applied a black patina to try to make them resemble the originals. I then used these replacement screws to attach the low voltage cap to the choke. The high voltage capacitor made me a bit nervous. Large paper caps sometimes contain environmentally hazardous oils, and while I'm pretty sure this isn't the case here, I still wasn't quite willing to trust this 75-year-old component with 500 volts. To minimize all forms of risk, I decided to leave the high voltage cap sealed, disconnect it from the circuit, and install a modern film capacitor alongside it. As I reassembled the machine, I did my best to route the wires according to the original wiring diagram. In some cases, I applied heat shrink tubing to the original wires to reinforce failing insulation. The wiring of the output connector was pretty messy and definitely not original, so I decided to redo it myself. For extra safety, I insulated all the lines that didn't connect to the chassis, to avoid shorting them against the conductive connector cover piece. Before reassembling the gearbox, I removed as much grease as I could from its components. I cleaned out the bearings, gear teeth, and various tight spots where debris and grease had accumulated over time. As I reinstalled the cleaned components, I applied a modern, sodium-based grease similar to the stuff that would have been used on this machine during wartime. For calibration and testing, I set up the GN45 as it would have been configured in the field. The generator housing includes attachments for metal legs designated LG2 and LG3. These legs hold the generator up off the ground on self-leveling feet, and provide a folding seat board for the operator. The original model GC7 hand cranks for this generator are very hard to find, so I had to opt for a post-war NATO production version. Even with this anachronism, I think the assembled unit looks pretty nice. For testing, I hooked up a dummy load sized to draw 50 watts on the 500 volt line and 12 watts on the 6 volt line. 
I retrieved the TL-127 voltage regulator calibration tool from inside the top cover, and sat down on the generator with the cover still removed. Then I used the calibration tool as a feeler gauge to set the air gap in the voltage regulator. This electromechanical regulator is my favorite component of the GN45. It implements a closed-loop voltage controller using only mechanical parts and electromagnetism. When the signal from the low-voltage commutator exceeds an adjustable threshold, a coil inside the regulator pulls this reed switch away from the normally closed position. In this state, a resistor is connected in series with the generator field winding, which puts a literal damper on the whole system. If this doesn't do enough to reduce the output voltage, the reed will continue to move across the gap until it contacts the other side, shorting out the field winding and effectively turning off the generator for an instant. Because of the negative feedback provided by this system, the output voltage of the machine remains approximately constant, even if the user turns the crank too quickly. With the regulator air gap set, I gave the generator its first few test cranks. Once it got up to speed, the main relay turned on, connecting the high voltage commutator to the output pin. Following the instructions in the signal core manual, I made adjustments to the regulator tension screw until the output voltage hovered around 500 volts. I then reinstalled the top cover, returning the generator to a fully assembled state. With everything working properly, I could finally experience the GN45 as it was originally used. Cranking this generator was a serious workout. The correct input speed is around 60 RPM, and I could only keep it running at the full 60 watt load for short periods of time. I can't imagine having to do this amidst the chaos of a Second World War battlefield. The regulator does its job well, keeping the output voltage between 500 and 600 volts at all times. The filter caps and chokes serve to smooth out some of the noise produced by the rapid oscillation of the reed, but a good amount still gets through on the low voltage line. On a scope, it's easy to see the action of the regulator cutting off the field periodically to prevent the output voltage from going too high. It'll be interesting to see how this filament noise affects the operation of the transmitter. With that, I've completed the functional restoration of the GN45. I hope this video was enjoyable and educational. Thanks as always to all the other radio and history enthusiasts who document their work, making projects like this possible. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, and if you have any questions or ideas for future projects, please leave them in the comments. The plans for the custom components I made in this video are linked in the description. I look forward to talking to you again, and, of course, thanks for watching.